One of the strengths of Darwin's theory of evolution versus Wallace's theory was that it was backed up by a lot of evidence that Darwin had collected over 20 years. This was also one of the strengths over Lamarck's theory of evolution. All three people had ideas that species change over time, but only Darwin provided convincing evidence of evolution. Our objectives for this lesson are to describe how the geologic distribution of species today relates to their evolutionary history. To identify how fossils help document the descent of modern species. Explain what homologous structures and similarities in development suggest about the process of evolutionary change. Describe how molecular biology can be used to trace the process of evolution. Explain what recent research of the Galapagos finches show about natural selection. We've learned about how Darwin researched both tortoises and finches on the Galapagos Islands. Think about what evidence you already know of that supports Darwin's theory of natural selection. Darwin's theory depended on assumptions involving many scientific fields. Scientists working in geology, physics, paleontology, chemistry, and embryology did not have the technology or understanding to test Darwin's assumptions during his lifetime. Other fields that are important in evolutionary theory, like genetics and molecular biology, didn't even exist yet. During the 150 years since Darwin published On the Origin of Species, research in all these fields has provided independent tests that could have supported or refuted Darwin's work. Astonishingly, every scientific test has supported Darwin's basic ideas about evolution. Darwin recognized the importance of patterns in the distribution of life the subject of the field called biogeography. Biogeography is the study of where organisms live now and where they and their ancestors lived in the past. Patterns in the distribution of living and fossil species combined with information from geology tell us how modern organisms evolved from their ancestors. Recall the two observations involving biogeog biogeography that were important to Darwin's thinking. First, closely related species evolved diverse adaptations in slightly different environments. Second, very distantly related species developed similar adaptations in similar environments. To Darwin, the biogeography of Galapagos species suggested that the populations of several bird species on the islands had evolved from mainland species. Over time, natural selection on different islands suggests, uh, I'm sorry, selected among individuals with different inherited variations. That caused populations on different islands to evolve into different but closely related species. In contrast, Darwin noted that similar ground-dwelling grassland birds in Europe, Australia, and Africa were not closely related, but they looked similar. Differences in basic body structures among those birds provides evidence that they evolved from different ancestors, but natural selection in similar habitats caused distantly related species to develop similar adaptations such as long legs and feet with toes adapted to running. Two potential difficulties for Charles Darwin's theory involved the age of Earth and gaps in the fossil record. Data collected since Darwin's time have addressed those difficulties and have provided dramatic support for an evolutionary view of life. Although James Hutton and Charles Lyell argued that Earth was old, 
Technology in their day couldn't determine just how old. Half a century after Darwin published his theory, however, physicists discovered radioactivity. Geologists now use radioactivity to establish the age of certain rocks and fossils. If these data had shown that Earth was young, Darwin's ideas would have been refuted and abandoned. How old do you think the Earth is? The best radioactive dating methods that we have indicate that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. This provides plenty of time for evolution by natural selection to take place. Darwin also struggled with what he called the imperfection of the geological record. Darwin's study of fossils had convinced him and other scientists that life evolved. But paleontologists in 1859 hadn't found enough fossils of intermediate life forms of life to document the evolution of modern species from their ancestors. Many recently discovered fossils form series that trace the evolution of modern species from extinct ancestors. Since Darwin, paleontologists have discovered hundreds of fossils that document intermediate stages in the evolution of many different groups of modern species. Recent fossils finds, I'm sorry, recent fossil finds connect the dots between dinosaurs and birds and between fish and four-legged land animals. In fact, so many intermediate forms have been found that it is often hard to tell where one group begins and another ends. All historical records are incomplete and the history of life is no exception. The evidence we do have, however, tells an unmistakable story of evolutionary change. Look at the image. One recently discovered fossil series documents the evolution of whales from ancient land mammals. Think about the evolution from ancient artiodactyl to modern whale. What might have happened? A shortening and change of limb shape is more adaptive to a water environment, as is a longer, more streamlined body. Recently, researchers have found more than 20 related fossils that document the evolution of modern whales from ancestors that walked on land. Several reconstructions based on fossil evidence are shown. Let's look at this other image. Describe how the limb structure of Ambulocetus suggests that these animals had the ability to swim as well as to walk. The limbs are strong enough to support the animal's weight and shaped well enough like fins. Describe how the limb structure of Rodhocetus demonstrates that it likely spent most of its time in water. It looks kind of like an alligator or crocodile, doesn't it? But it's a mammal, not a reptile. The hind limbs of Rhodocetus were short and probably not able to bear much weight. Which of the animals shown was probably the most recent to live primarily on? The most recent to live primarily on land was Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus. And I'm sorry, this is Ambulocetus. Uh, the Ambulocetus is the third organism we see here. And the, the prefix ambulo actually refers to walking. Cetus refers to the fact that these are ancestors of whales. Whales are known as cetaceans. This image continues from the last image. We can show the continuation of the evolution of whales. These organisms spend their entire lives swimming in the ocean. Look at the limb structure of Basilosaurus. Think about how it demonstrates that it spends its entire life swimming. The Basilosaurus is not an animal that would get up out of the water and start walking around. It has a streamlined body and reduced hind limbs. 
The skeletal features suggest that Basilosaurus spent its entire life swimming in the ocean. Modern whales retain reduced pelvic bones, and in some cases, upper and lower limb bones. However, these structures no longer play a role in locomotion. Think about it. Why would an an organism that spends its entire life in water have pelvic bones or upper and lower limb bones? And the answer is that they evolved from ancestral species that used those, those bones to help them walk around on land. Since Charles Darwin Scientists have puzzled over how this transition occurred until the recent discovery of intermediate forms like Ambulocetus. Think about specific changes that took place in the evolution of the whale or whales. Why might it have been? been an advantage for Ambulocetus to be able to swim as well as walk, <clears throat> or for Dorudon to have reduced hind limbs and a streamlined body. Each of these animals shown represents a branch in the evolutionary history of whales. Fossils of whale ancestors have been found in places that are no longer covered by water. For example, Fossils of Ambulocetus and Rhodocetus were found in desert regions of Pakistan. How could fossils for amphibious or aquatic organisms be found in a desert? Well, they could be found in a desert because the environment has changed since the organisms represented by the fossils lived there. That did not used to be a desert. In fact, it might have at one time been underwater. Think about what this means for natural selection or evolution. How does environmental change relate to natural selection? By Charles Darwin's time, scientists had noted that all vertebrate limbs had the same basic bone structure. Yet some were used for crawling, some for climbing, some for running, and others for flying. Darwin proposed that animals with similar structures evolved from a common ancestor with the basic versions of that structure. Similar structures that are shared by related species and that have been inherited from a common ancestor are called homologous structures. Make sure you put that in your notes, homologous structures. Evolutionary theory explains the existence of homologous structures adapted to different purposes as the result of descent with modification from a common ancestor. Biologists test whether structures are homologous by studying anatomical details, the way structures develop in embryos, and the pattern in which they appeared over evolutionary history. Similarities and differences among homologous structures help determine how recently species shared a common ancestor. For example, many bones of reptiles and birds are more similar to one another in structure and development than they are to similar bones of mammals. These similarities indicate that the common ancestor of reptiles and birds lived more recently than the common ancestor of reptiles, birds, and mammals. So birds are more closely related to crocodiles than they are to bats. It's strange when you think about it because birds and bats both fly and are they, they appear more similar than crocodiles, but birds are more closely related to crocodiles than bats. The key to identifying homology, that's a uh, the presence of homologous structures. The key to identifying homology is common structure and origin during development, not common function. 
A bird's wing and a horse's front limb, which are homologous structures, have similar structures and development, but different functions. Biologists have identified homologous structures in many other organisms. Certain groups of plants, for example, share homologous stems, roots, and flowers. Find the blue colored bones on these pictures. Those are the finger bones, or the technical term for those are phalanges. So find the blue colored bones, the phalanges, of the ancient fish ancestor of modern vertebrates. That's the ancient lobe-finned fish. Then find the same bones in each of the land vertebrate descendants shown in the figure. Descri describe to yourself how the bones differ in relative size and shape among the modern vertebrates. You can see how they develop similarly, even though they all serve different purposes. Chickens and horses use their phalanges for very different things. Infer how each of the modern forms is adapted to its function. The long single finger of the horse elongates the arm, enabling faster running without much weight gain or air resistance. The body parts of organisms that share common functions but not common structure and development are called analogous structures. The wing of a bee and the wing of a bird are analogous structures. They have different structures and development, but they both allow the organisms to fly. They are analogous. Do you think the shell of a clam and the shell of a lobster are homologous or analogous structures? The shell of a clam and the shell of a lobster are probably analogous because they have a common function. They protect and support the animals, but not a common structure. Not all, <clears throat> excuse me, not all homologous structures have important functions. Vestigial structures are inherited from ancestors, but have lost much of their original size and function due to different selection pressures acting on the descendant. For example, the limbs in this dotted line robust slider, it's, it's not a snake, it's a skink, it's a type of skink, and its limbs are vestigial structures. In their ancestors, you can see the little tiny legs uh, right up front sitting on top of that leaf, that's a, that's a vestigial leg. In the ancestors, these limbs played a role in locomotion. However, as the skink adapted to movement, the limbs were not needed and this function was lost. Why do organisms retain structures that are just vestiges or traces of the original? One possibility is that the presence of the structure does not affect an organism's fitness. And so natural selection does not act in a way to eliminate it. The term vestigial is not synonymous with useless. Sometimes a vestigial structure can have a non-obvious function. For example, the vestigial hip bones of large whales seem to play a role in male reproduction. They don't play the same role they did in the land-dwelling organisms. They don't help the whale walk around, but they do still play a role, so they are considered vestigial but not useless. How does a secondary function, as in the hip bones of some large whales, help to explain why vestigial structures remain? But if the structure has a function, then it's more likely that it is selected for in terms of natural selection. For example, if the whale needs the vestigial hip bones to reproduce, individuals without the vestigial bones would have a very low fitness. Development researchers noticed a long time ago that the early developmental stages of many animals with backbones, called vertebrates, look very similar. Recent observations make clear that the same group of embryonic cells developed in the same order and in similar patterns to produce many homologous tissues and organs.
For example, despite the very different adult shapes and functions of the limb bones, all those bones develop from the same clumps of embryonic cells. Evolutionary theory offers the most logical explanation for these similarities in patterns of development. Similar patterns of embryological development provide further evidence that the organisms have descended from a common ancestor. Charles Darwin realized that similar patterns of development offer important clues to the ancestry of living organisms. He could not have anticipated, however, the incredible amount of evidence for his theory that would come from studying the genes that control development. Evidence from the fields of genetics and molecular biology. Those are fields that did not exist during Darwin's time. The most troublesome missing information for Charles Darwin had to do with heredity. Darwin had no idea how heredity worked and he was deeply worried that his, this lack of knowledge might prove fatal to his theory. Today, genetics provides some of the strongest evidence supporting evolutionary theory. A long series of discoveries from Gregor Mendel to James Watson and Francis Crick to genomics helps explain how evolution works. At the molecular level, overwhelming similarities in the genetic code of all organisms along with clearly homologous molecules, provide evidence of common descent. So think about that. Now that we're able to actually tell what molecules things are made of, we find not only homologous structures like limbs, but homologous molecules in organisms. And that provides more evidence of common ancestry. Also, we now understand how mutation and gene shuffling during sexual reproduction produce the heritable variation on which natural selection operates. One example of molecular evidence for evolution is so basic that by this point in your study of biology, you might take it for granted. All living cells use information coded in DNA and RNA to carry information from one generation to the next and to direct protein synthesis. This genetic code is nearly identical in almost all organisms, including bacteria, yeasts, plants, fungi, and animals. This is powerful evidence that all organisms evolved from a common or from common ancestors that shared this genetic code. In Darwin's day, biologists could only study similarities and differences in structures they could see, but Physical body structures can't be used to compare mice with yeast or bacteria. Today, we know that homology resulting from common ancestors shows up at the molecular level too. Homologous proteins have been found in some surprising places. Homologous proteins share extensive structural and chemical similarities. One homologous protein is cytochrome C which function which functions in cellular respiration. Remarkably similar variations of cytochrome C are found in almost all living cells, from cells of baker's yeast to cells in humans. There are many other kinds of homologies at the molecular level. Genes can be homologous too, which makes sense given the genetic code that all organisms share. One spectacular example is a set of ancient genes that determines the identities of body parts. Known as Hox genes, H-O-X, they help determine the head to tail axis in embryonic development. In vertebrates, sets of homologous Hox genes direct the growth of front and hind limbs. Small changes in these genes can produce dramatic changes in the structures they control. So relatively minor changes in an organism's genome or its, its set of genes can produce major changes in an organism's structure and the structure of its descendants. At least some homologous Hox genes are found in almost all multicellular animals from fruit flies to 
to humans. Such profound biochemical similarities are best explained by Darwin's conclusion. Living organisms evolved through descent with modification from a common ancestor. Which type of evidence for evolution do you think is more informative? Fossil evidence or genetic evidence? Well, mole molecular data can indicate how long living organisms have been evolving separately. However, unlike fossils, molecular evidence does not give any indication of what extinct organisms looked like, how they moved, or what they ate. So both fossil evidence and molecular biology help us understand the relationships and the lineage, the relationships between and the lineages of different species. One way to gather evidence for evolutionary change is to observe natural selection and action. But most examples of evolutionary change discussed so far took place over millions of years, which makes it tough or impossible to see change actually happening. Some kinds of evolutionary change, however, have been observed and studied repeatedly in labs and in controlled outdoor environments. Scientists have designed experiments involving organisms from bacteria to guppies to test Charles Darwin's theories. Each time the results have supported Tar Darwin's basic ideas. But one of the best examples of natural selection in action comes from observations on animals living in their natural environment. Fittingly, those observations focused on Galapagos finches. When Darwin first saw the Galapagos finches, he thought they were wrens, warblers, and blackbirds because they looked so different from one another. Once Darwin learned that the birds were all finches, he hypothesized that they had descended from a common ancestor. Darwin noted that several finch species have beaks of very different sizes and shapes. Each species uses its beak like a specialized tool to pick up and handle its food. Darwin proposed that natural selection had shaped the beaks of different bird populations as they became adapted to eat different foods. That was a reasonable hypothesis, but was there any way to test it? No one thought so until Peter and Rosemary Grant of Princeton University came along. The Grants have spent 40 years studying Galapagos finches. They realized that Darwin's hypothesis rested on two testable assumptions. First, for beak size and shape to evolve, there must be enough heritable variation in those traits to provide raw material for natural selection. Second, differences in beak size and shape must produce differences in fitness. The Grants tested these hypotheses on the medium ground finch, Geospisa fortis, on the island of Daphne Major. This island is large enough to support good-sized finch populations, yet small enough to allow the grants to catch, tag, and identify nearly every bird. During their day, the grants periodically recapture the birds. They record which individuals are alive and which have died, which have reproduced, and which have not. For each individual, the grants record wing length, leg length, beak length, beak depth, beak color, feather colors, and total mass. Beak size and shape are crucial to the fitness of Darwin's finches. So the grants focused on these traits in their research. Beak size and shape determine what kind of food the bird is going to be able to eat. The right, the right size and shape beak for a bird is the right tool for a specific job. A, a bird that wants to eat bees needs a different shaped beak than a bird that wants to eat seeds out of a tree. Consider how difficult it would be for the finches to eat if they did not have a beak that was well suited for their food source. For example, if the Geospisa finch had a thin, narrow beak like the Certhidia finch, it would be like using delicate 
forceps or tweezers to crack hard nutshells. Well, that's not what's needed. What's needed by the Certhidia, I, I'm sorry, what's needed by the Geospiza is something more like a nutcracker, something that are a, uh, something that will really apply a lot of pressure and crack open those shells. Many students think that evolution cannot be observed, so it can't be prove, proven. Although most major evolutionary changes happen too slowly to be observed directly, there are many examples, including the Grant's research, that show evolution in real time. Look at these graphs. They show various data collected from the Galapagos. The Grant's data show that there is indeed great variation of heritable traits among Galapagos finches. Their data have also shown that individual finches with different sized beaks have better or worse chances of surviving seasonal droughts and longer dry spells. When food becomes scarce during dry periods, birds with the largest beaks are more likely to survive. As a result, average beak size in this finch population increases dramatically. The grants have documented that natural selection takes place in wild finch populations frequently and sometimes. Changes in food supply create selection pressure that causes finch populations to evolve within decades. This evolutionary change occurs much faster than many researchers thought possible. This work shows that individual variation causes differential reproductive success during times when environmental resources are limiting. Not only have the grants documented natural selection in nature, but their data also confirm that the effect of natural selection on a population is related to the existence of inherited variation. Variation that doesn't matter much under normal environmental conditions, but becomes adaptive as the environment changes during a drought. The Grant's work shows that variation within a species increases a population's ability to adapt to and survive environmental change. Without heritable variation in beak sizes, the medium ground finch would not be able to adapt to feeding on larger, tougher seeds during a drought. Advances in many fields of biology, along with other sciences, have confirmed and expanded most of Darwin's hypotheses. Today, evolutionary theory, which includes natural selection, offers insights that are vital to all branches of biology, from research on infectious disease to ecology. That's why evolution is often called the grand unifying theory of the life sciences. Like any scientific theory, Evolutionary theory is constantly reviewed as new data are gathered. Researchers still debate important questions, such as precisely how new species arise and why species become extinct. There's also significant uncertainty about how exactly life began. However, any questions that remain are about how evolution works, not whether evolution occurs. To scientists, evolution is the key to understanding the natural world.